It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, I don't often get the chance to, to talk to intelligent audiences because mostly I'm at surgical conferences. So uh, being in places where people understand things is very helpful. So we, there's been a bit of talk this morning, and I won't belabor the point because that obviously uh, a vascular surgeon telling hematology audience why we get blood clots is, is beyond my remit. Uh, but it's important to understand for most people in uh, pregnancy that there are many factors from Verco's triad, uh, who of course, as we know, is the reason for World Thrombosis Day, that impact on the reason why a pregnant woman may be more at risk of blood clot or somebody with underlying uh, mechanical uh, issues may develop a blood clot in pregnancy where they would otherwise not have. And I think our uh, main interest as we become more experienced with the alternative options to uh, uh, traditional medical management to patients with uh, DVT in pregnancy is to try and work out what we can do about preventing post-thrombotic syndrome after the event, and in particular those patients who present with iliofemoral DVT. And I think it's important when we talk about treating patients, uh, and especially in light of the evidence that is coming out from some of the trials that are now being published, that we are really talking about people with extensive DVT. I think none of us, uh, surgical, and certainly not in our practice, uh, uh, where we, we manage these patients, would advocate aggressive strategies to treat somebody with cough, vein, DVT, or even at this stage in, in DVT that's limited to the femoral vein. However, if you get an extensive leg vein DVT that does go into the pelvis, and does involve the entire leg. The risk of PTS after the event, and you can see this picture of somebody with a leg ulcer uh, down the line, is significant. And all the uh, current published data would support a PTS rate in these patients in the order of 50 to 60%, uh, which we have not been able to reduce with current best medical practice as such uh, over time. And these patients are significantly debilitated by their disease. We could rephrase the question that we posed about treating patients in a slightly more prosaic fashion uh, as to whether we should be offering patients lysis. And uh, the idea here is that the, the disease of post-thrombotic syndrome at the end of the day is an absolute disaster for these patients. And I may be uh, slightly prejudiced uh, in our practice because we are seeing the people who are at the worst end of the spectrum. Uh, but it does motivate us to try and work out how we can get better at doing things. And, and like all things in medicine, uh, where we all started off uh, 150 years ago applying leeches to people's bodies to try and drain them of toxic spirits, we move on by advancing our understanding of things and getting better at delivering what we do. The evidence for lysis is difficult, and in particular if we think about a group of patients who are pregnant, we're never likely to get very good studies of randomizing pregnant women to lytic-based treatment or not, or any of these other things, because it makes running a trial extremely complex and the ethics of it is exceptionally difficult. So we have to try and extrapolate some of our data. At the moment, there's really two major trials that look at providing acute DVT lysis. One was CAVENT, which has now followed the patients out to five years and is starting to show benefits the longer you follow the patients up, which of course makes sense, because we know that PTS takes a long time to manifest itself completely. The second one is ATRACT, which has just published, uh, just presented its data and is due for publication in the, in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, in the next couple of weeks. And this trial is hugely controversial um, at the moment, not least because it has maintained the point that there is no difference between offering patients lysis or best medical management for uh, DVT in preventing uh, post-thrombotic syndrome. Uh, the problem with a track, like all trials, when we look at evidence, is, is what you set out to prove in the beginning is often uh, it's, it determines the outcome you're going to get. So the principal problem with ATRACT is using the Velelta score as a binary outcome measure for whether or not you have PTS. So uh, if you had a Velelta score of more than 5 in ATRACT, you failed the primary outcome measure, less than 5 was success. But if you look at symptom improvement in the treated versus non-treated group, they were significantly better off from purely symptom improvement over time and far less likely to get severe post-thrombotic syndrome. So we judge very few things in medicine by a binary outcome measure of cured or not. And if we did that, we wouldn't have any treatments for cancer pretty much uh, because if we didn't cure the disease and we didn't offer the treatment, we'd be getting nowhere. So I have a bit of a problem with ATRACT, and I think hopefully once we see the published data, we can, we can analyze it in more detail and work out what the principal question is, is which people should we be offering treatment to and which we, we should not be offering treatment to. It's about refining treatment delivery 
not limiting it to no one. So what's the problem with acute DVT in pregnancy is, is there are two phases, as we know, where you're going to end up with a blood clot before the baby has been delivered and in the, in the postnatal period. And this does change treatment decisions to some extent. Our practice is really, if you get a DVT in your pregnancy, is to try and see if we can manage the patient conservatively until delivery and then take a view. And this is largely because a lot of people will get better as the hemodynamic aspects of pregnancy return to normal, the leg will improve. But there are cases where we probably do have to think about things in the middle of, uh, during a pregnancy. And I've been involved, sadly, in a case discussion in the last few weeks of a woman who presented in the southwest of England with an, a threatened limb from a, an acute DVT. And the decision was made that it's not possible to treat a woman in pregnancy with clot. You've got, got to leave it. And she ended up losing her baby and losing her leg as a consequence of phlegmasis through lidolins and progression. So I think like all things, it's not about categorical answers or, or statements that we draw lines in concrete and as we discussed earlier on, sitting on the fence or not. It's about making individual decisions for patients at the time and assessing the relative risk and benefit of that particular situation as to what you're going to do. So the dangers of delivering any clot-based or lytic-based therapy to a, 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 a woman who is pregnant is of course radiation to the pelvis and bleeding risk. And both of those, particularly radiation, we can really reduce substantially nowadays with uh, new ultrasound-based techniques, in particular IVIS. And there are risks associated with bleeding that we potentially can manage. But ideally, we'd like to wait. After delivery, the concerns again come back to bleeding and clotting issues. It's obviously a profoundly prothrombotic state. You have to manage that. Uh, and you have to consider the risks of, of significant postpartum hemorrhage that may be accompanied by lytics, which may be worse uh, than somebody who doesn't have those risks. And of course, when you're managing a, a woman who has just delivered a baby, there is the child to consider in that early maternal bonding that is important. And we've seen a number of reports of uh, that being a problem for people who end up in hospital for prolonged periods of time with DVT. Conservative options for managing PTS really revolve around stockings, dressings, and anticoagulants. And we now have multiple meta-analyses in the available literature that show that stockings do not work. Uh, I think there are uh, severe criticisms of the SOX trial, which has been the basis for most of the discussions about not using stockings. Uh, and my personal opinion is that stockings do work, and stockings are effective, but you have to have them from day one when you get a blood clot. You can't send somebody stockings in the post that arrive three or four weeks later and then expect the patient to be compliant. And socks, again, when they said stockings don't work, based compliance on stockings at only wearing them for three days out of seven during the week. So if you're only wearing stockings three days out of seven and you only start wearing them three weeks down the line, I can't see, see it as much of a surprise that a trial comparing use to no use is not going to show a difference because really you're comparing nothing to nothing. Uh, most of the trials have been focused on prevention of VT recurrence. And the principal aspect of this has been, do you stop another blood clot and do you restore some degree of patency to a blood vessel? So these blood vessels, or these veins, are patent by definition because there's flow in them on duplex scan and you can see contrast in them. But there is absolutely no way that a vessel that looks like this at the end of, uh, of your treatment for VT is ever going to restore somebody to normal. There is a significant outflow obstruction. And these pictures are from a 25-year-old girl who developed a, a VT after um, a, a long-haul flight. She was a marathon runner, and she's never been able to get back to that. Her leg is okay, but she can walk about 500 yards with, with her vessels that look like this. And fortunately, being a surgeon, you get the opportunity to, to look at vessels close up. And this is what, what we call chronic clot, which is a term that is probably largely um, uh, redundant. This is what what it looks like when you open up the blood vessel. So that's the venogram on the left with what the vessel looks like when you open it on the right. And you can see that over time, you get the significant scar tissue formation inside the vessel with multiple webs and channels. And the vein is supposed to be a compliance vessel. When you exercise, it gets bigger. It allows for blood flow to come out. If your vein looks like that, it's never going to work as it should. So while these patients may not end up with a leg that is big and swollen or their, their skin may be okay, um, they do end up with significantly disabling symptoms that prevent them from working, prevent them from enjoying their life with their children, 
Uh, I have many patients who can't take their children for a walk in the park because they can't walk. They can't walk uphill, they can't do the things that they want to do, and this is a destructive thing on quality of life in the long run. And I think we understate quality of life. We focus so much of our healthcare budget on death and dollars that we forget about things that actually matter. We spend, in our hospital, we're a big thoracic abdominal aneurysm centre. We, we, we spend £100,000 per patient on fixing somebody with a, a, an 8 centimetre thoracic aneurysm whose life expectancy is two years and we won't spend any money on helping people with post-thrombotic syndrome. I think it's something we really should challenge ourselves on in how we think about healthcare delivery. And this is another case, just to illustrate that this is not an innocuous thing that doesn't cost people their limbs. So this young lady is 32 years old, had seven, uh, uh, has had seven children. Uh, she had DVTs in every single pregnancy, and this is what her leg looks like at the end of that process. So this is post-thrombotic syndrome. Uh, and there was no option for her but to amputate her leg because we could not turn this back at the time that we, we finally got to see this patient and try and help her. So PTS may not be this bad in everybody, but it can be limb-threatening. And our problem, like everything else, is if we thought we had no evidence for some of the decisions when there's 100 patients in a trial, I have even less evidence to guide decisions on in this group of patients. And what we can't do is predict who ends up like this. So if we have 100 people with a VTE, 50 will be fine. 50 will have post-thrombotic syndrome, and about 5 or 10 will end up like this. But we can't predict that at the time, and that's really where we need to focus our efforts and research is trying to work out how we tailor treatment to appropriate patients, get the right people at the right time. This is what we're trying to achieve with thromb thrombolysis. This is a lady who was uh, uh, six weeks postpartum with a DVT. Uh, came in with a swollen leg, we lysed her, and at the end of it ended up stenting. And you can see the picture on the right as we're trying to get an open vein. That's the whole idea, is restore a vein to normal. We have lots of different options nowadays, which has really changed what we do. And some of this helps us to reduce the bleeding risk. So there was a device called Trellis, which has unfortunately gone off the market, but we have a, a, a device which we principally use called AngioJet, which pulses lytic into the clot and then helps us suck it all out. And what this is trying to do is reduce the time that you treat patients down to about four or five hours so you're not running lysis for two or three days where the risk of bleeding is clearly going to go up. Uh, we have a number of other devices which do not require you to use lytic at all. Uh, and this really helps if you've got a high-risk bleeding situation. So, for example, this patient had, had a big uh, retroperitoneal bleed which then blocked the iliac vein and that caused their DVT and we used a device that aspirates all the clots, sucked it out and stented it to get that picture on the right and restored their leg, which was, which was threatened, back to normal. Most of what we end up dealing with at the end when you get a woman who has extensive iliofemoral DVT is what we call may or Cockett syndrome. Uh, we use the term Cockett syndrome uh, at St. Thomas's because Cockett was in our hospital and he described it around about the same time as May and Therna. And at that stage, you didn't have the benefit of, of Google to be able to look things up. And May and Therna were Austrian, and their paper was published in a German journal. So, of course, nobody in England read German journals in the 1950s. Uh, and so uh, the, the competition was on as to who described it first. But there's about six months between them, I guess. So technically, it should be May and Therna. They were first, but we'll stick with Cockett on occasions at St. Thomas's. The idea with may or Cockett syndrome is that you have compression of the iliac vein by the overlying iliac artery, and that's here. Now, what we have to remember is it's normal anatomy to look like that. Everything crosses from left to right, and it's not abnormal to see some form of compression. And the real problem we have at the moment, and I was speaking to one of the patients that I know well earlier who's involved in Thrombosis UK, is that the perfusion of social media websites at the moment, particularly Facebook groups, who are driving people to diagnose themselves with may syndrome, other compression syndromes, and various other things, that then create this sort of hysteria to treat things. It's a real problem. But what may syndrome is, is that when you have this, and over a prolonged period of time you get damage to the vein, you end up with scarring and webs and spurs forming in the vein. Without scarring of the vein, it's not may syndrome. And this predisposes you to blood clot. And Verco recognized this many years ago. So this is not a surprise to any of us that there is a, a causal link between compression of the iliac vein and clot in the left leg. There are other compression points that you can get which occur at any of the vessel crossings. So it's not just one point. 
But these underlying anatomical disorders lead to iliofemoral DVT. And probably about 80% of the patients we see who have iliofemoral DVT end up requiring a stent. So that raises a second issue, is what do you do if you have a venous stent and you want to go on and have more children? And that's a question we get posed quite frequently. And in our practice, we've had a look at this. The data, again, is poor. There's uh, probably two or three publications around the subject. Uh, we look back at our results over three years of patients who had been stented and subsequently went on to have a baby. Um, and the, the median age at which they had their stent was 31 years. So it is a young age group of patients who are going to have a stent. And we follow them all up with a duplex surveillance program. And the good thing is, for the most part, patients do fine. So we had one patient who thrombosed the left limb of a bifurcated stent. She had got extensive iliocaval DVT after her first pregnancy with underlying lupus. We had lies that she had been fine for three years, then decided to have another baby. And at the time that uh, she was coming up for delivery, she wanted spinal epidural, and we probably interrupted anticoagulation for a little bit too long, and then she clotted off the one side, which we then subsequently managed to recanalize and sort out. Uh, but on the whole, the stents do quite well. There doesn't seem to be a problem with them. And as long as you manage the anticoagulation appropriately, uh, you're probably fine having a stent in through your pregnancy. So these are the sort of the way that we, we look at managing anticoagulation in the perinatal period for high-risk patients. And I think one of the discussion points probably to have in terms of consent is if you're going to, if you're high-risk, the antiphospholipid syndrome or lupus or so on, and you're going to have a, a baby. It's not, it's not a contraindication to stenting, but it's a, a discussion to be had about how you manage that perinatal period and how you manage the delivery and what your options are in terms of cesarean section, uh, spinal e epidural anesthesia, and so forth. And we're fortunate in St. Thomas's, one of the great joys of working in this hospital is we have really good experts around us. And the whole point about managing these patients is it's managed by a team of people, a team of experts who know what they're doing. It's not one person. It's not me saying, let's do this. We have a really good team with Beverly and Kathy Nelson, Piercy, and other people you, you, you will know for, for very well who manage our patients together. So the summary really is clot removal strategies are possible, both in the peri- and postpartum period. It's really dependent on risk assessment for that individual patient. If their limb is threatened, you, you really need to do something. That's a different thing from somebody who's got some swelling in their calf and you can manage them through their pregnancy and deal with it afterwards. It's preferable to wait, if possible, until delivery. Uh, venous stents can remain patent during pregnancy despite prothrombotic tendency, so it's not a contraindication to stenting and having a stent is not a contraindication to pregnancy. You have to manage the anticoagulation very carefully and you have to have a multidisciplinary team of people who are going to be involved in their care. So that's all I have to say. Thank you very much.